introduce uh, Terry Heck, our new, our next speaker. Uh, he kind of hails or comes from uh, Nevada and, and Montana. Has some previous experience there with NRCS and the BLM. And he came to us in 2004 and was the district conservationist in Oneida, and now is our range management specialist in Pierce. So I'd like to welcome him to the floor. So thank you. Familiar faces in the crowd. Since taking this position in Pier, um, I've had an opportunity to be on a lot of landowners' places through the years, and and uh, it's good to see it. I find it hard to believe that after the last couple years that we've had, we're talking about drought and dry conditions. I, I can remember coming up here and stopping at the field office and they'd give me directions, but the directions were not direct. I had to drive <laughs> way over yonder and around to come around because the roads were washed out or flooded. So that's a, that, that's a great example of where we live. I mean, that, that's as quick as it can turn around. That's the northern Great Plains in general. It, uh, you know, that was, that's the old saying, it blink your eye, it's going to change. So. We've all been there. We've all kind of dealt with that uh, in some form or fashion. Um, visiting with Neil and Holly here a few weeks ago, they were talking about this this meeting and and uh, some of the questions they were getting. Uh, the big question is is uh, what's the forecast for production on grasslands? Uh, hopefully, we'll try to bring some attention to that. But I thought I'd do something a little bit different uh, with, with, with this workshop and this discussion. Um, working in several states, being on a lot of operations, being on a lot of workshops, range tours, I've had a, a, an opportunity to work with a lot of landowners. And a lot of the discussions were about management, uh, what they do during drought, what they do when it's not dry. Um, you know, and I made notes of all that, developing plans, and occasionally I go back and look at that stuff, and you always think there's a magic recipe to everything, um, and I really don't run into that, but there's some really good information there that I've kind of gathered from other landowners on what they do and when these conditions come up, and I'm going to try to kind of relay some of that to you today, uh, so that you can maybe, you know, I've never heard of that, or... That might be something I might be willing to, to, to try to make some adjustments on your grazing management and herd management. Uh, and, and, and like Jeff said, hopefully this kind of dry spell we had was just a little kick in the pants and it, we get some moisture and we can get over this. So. about that historical perspective and I mean this is nothing new um, it is where we live it, it, we go through these dry cycles we go through wet cycles and, and sometimes they happen fairly quick and uh, you just have to kind of go with the flow with the roller coaster and, um, I, I found some real neat information on some dendrochronological work where they they actually looked at some growth rings on trees in the Black Hills and, it, and it's rather interesting. Uh, current conditions, that's where I'm going to kind of talk about, you know, what we're, we're thinking is coming up. And a lot of that goes back, if you're really looking at grown grass, you really need to be looking at what happened last year and what happened to a certain extent the previous year. So we're looking at 11 and 12 to really make some forecasts for, for what's coming up. But there's some caveats to that, um, and, and we'll kind of get into that a little bit. And then grazing management, um, no doubt, I'll say it right off the bat, that's the biggest thing you can uh, have in your uh, toolkit for, for dealing with drought is, you know, what are you currently doing grazing management wise? What's the condition of your grasslands? It really, really dictates how this drought, these dry spells will affect you short term and long term. And then drought contingency plans. And, and a lot of that is uh, some of the stuff I've kind of collected through the years, working with other landowners. And uh, hopefully I, we kind of talk about some things that are, are a little bit different, maybe or maybe haven't uh, tried or heard about. Um, 
and so forth. So. Okay, um, I'm going to kind of go through this kind of quick. In 92, they went into the Black Hills, Ponderosa Pine. Um, they do increment bores on, they did increment bores on trees. Um, basically, they core into the tree, pull the core out, and if everybody, if everybody here has cut down a tree or, or, or seen a, a sawed off tree, you see all these rings. Well, those are growth rings. And as the tree grows, it lays down the ring each year. So out toward the bark, is the the most recent year and as you go in you can kind of age the tree well one of the things that you can kind of uh, come to con some conclusions on some of these rings is if they're narrow in size you can assume that it was dry there wasn't much growth that year if they're wider then it was probably wetter so if you really want to look at drought patterns uh, so to speak you know we've only been relatively wise, keeping rainfall records and everything fairly recent, you know, last 100, 120 years. If you really want to go back and look at some of these drought cycles that have happened through the course of time, trees are a great way to kind of put that together. I don't know if you can see this or not, but they put together this list of the 15 driest years, ranked them, and how they ranked them was the, the length of the drought and the magnitude. And the magnitude would mean the rings were really close on the dry years. And on the wet years, same thing on the length, but the wider the tree rings were, the growth rings were, is how they came to those conclusions. I highlighted number seven here. That's the 1933 to 1942 drought. That's the one that we all kind of remember. That was the Dust Bowl. That drought didn't even make the top five. Number one up here, 1531 to 1551. And I'll admit. I remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> I need to hear more. <laughs> I, I'll admit, I had to do a little Google search to find what historical event happened about then, because I didn't know. Uh, 1531 was about, the, that was the year that uh, King Henry VIII declared himself the uh, head of the Church of England. <laughs> Did you remember that? <laughs> When you really start looking at this stuff, this really puts things in perspective. I mean, these, these events happen. That, that particular event was 21 years long. You imagine if you were kind of around then and you were uh, trying to grow <laughs> crops and raise cattle. Of course, you probably would have known no different. I mean, it was dry all the time, but, you know, that's a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. But again, here, here, here's the, the, the longest, the number one wettest period, and that was 1429 to 1448, 20 years. So you can get the other side. What I want to point out here is uh, back, back here in 1933 to 1942, you can see it jumps right down here to 1943 to 47 on the wet side. So there are these events that show up on these growth rings where there was that dry cycle for 10 years and boom, it went to a wet cycle within a short period of time. It's pretty common when you look at that. Is this coming from the Black Hills data? Yep. You actually have trees that old in Black Hills? Well, here's what happened. Most of the ponderosa pine in the hills has been burned or, 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 or uh, logged off. Uh, they did find one tree that was 700 years old, which is very rare. So a lot of this data, you know, when it gets extremely old, is kind of based off that one tree. So statistics, statistically, there may be a little bit of variability there, but that's kind of how, how it boiled down. You know, most of the trees out there are probably 100, 150 or less. Okay, um, 
and most of you know this already, that uh, when you look at the grasslands, and particularly in this area, uh, and this is actually a, a page out of one of our ecolog ecological site descriptions for Lomi for this, uh, for this area. A lot of our grasses, for the most part, in this northern wheatgrass, uh, needlegrass uh, plains, is cool season grasses. And when do cool season grasses typically grow? It's that early time of the spring, April, May, June. 85% uh, of their growth is typically done about June 1st, somewhere near. So there's that kind of that uh, uh, peak production. Kind of it happens then. And then there's they kind of go dormant, and then there's kind of a, a pickup again, a little bit in uh, say October or September and October, and that's cool season grasses, that's when they produce the most. Now there's the warm season grasses which is uh, like corn, they tend to do their growth when we're in a little bit of a warmer uh, temperatures coming into July, August, those kinds of things. So that's important to remember because that has uh, a lot of um, direction or uh, meaningfulness when rain comes, it, when it hits the right time of the year for those kinds of grasses. Okay, this is exactly what I talked about. These are some growth curves. The green is the cool season grasses. Uh, you can kind of see how their growth is kind of spiking here right around that April, May, June area. Then they kind of lull off. And then there's a little bit of a kick there in the fall. Here's the warm season grasses. So just by looking at that, you can kind of draw some conclusions. Boy, it appears to me it's kind of important that we get some rainfall in that period and this period. If you really want to grow cool season grasses. Okay, here's some actual data that I pulled off of the Viola uh, weather station. And this was at Roscoe. Last or the fall of 2011, Leola, and this this red line is actually average. Here's what Leola got roughly in that September October window of fall of 2011. Now we're talking pr production for last year, about 0.62 inches. They norm you normally should get about 3.15. So right there, it was significantly less, about 46 percent of it. Spring of 2012, last year, uh, 4.42. And I'll tell you what, you look at this, this is the actual rainfall in, in blue. Look at that big spike there in April. There, obviously, there was some big rains that come through here right about then. If you hadn't have got that, wow, it would have been really tough. But anyway, you ended up with about 4.42 inches in that April, May, June window, which you should normally get about 7.8. Uh, running some of our uh, our drought tool, and I'm going to get to that. It actually will forecast or actually give you a percent of normal production based on some of that rainfall data, and it pulls it from weather stations. 65% of normal production is kind of an estimate, and that's looking at right at the first part of July based on these rainfall events. Good on the Roscoe, it was a little bit different. They got a little more rain in the fall, 2.03 inches. They normally get 3.08, got a little better spring, they ended up at about 85% of them. You know, that's, that's a pretty big difference. But it kind of illustrates when those rains come really make a big difference. Okay, this is a U.S. drought monitor. Um, I know we're all kind of watching that. We usually see it on the news. Um, here's what it looked like October. And I kind of look at what it looked like at the end of the growing season of the previous year. And you can kind of see how it laid out. Here's what it looked like as of uh, a, a few days ago, March 19th. Uh, in this neck of the woods, the severe uh, and moderate kind of shifted around a little bit. Uh, down in this neck of the woods, you can kind of see um, that it, exceptional drought kind of moved up a little bit. Uh, extreme drought in, in the western side of the state has actually crept up a little bit. So for the most part, it's still about the same. It really hasn't changed a whole lot. And when it comes to grass production, it needs to be really, you need to be really thinking about 
these months that are coming up, April, May, and June. You know, that's going to be a big difference. There. Okay. Uh, there are some of these maps in the back there, and this is that um, kind of our projection that we've come up with. And what it's what, what what it did is it, it did exactly what I kind of showed there. Is we, we looked at rainfall based on all these weather stations across South Dakota, collected that data, and it looked at two years ago, and it looked at last year, and we come up with some projections. You look down here, percent of normal uh, average forage production. Uh, you get into this color, it's suggestion that we got about a 70% 70, 70 of normal forage production. As you start creeping up into the yellows, it gets a little bit better. One thing you got to remember there is this down here. Projected status assuming future average precipitation is average. So this is going to happen if we get April, May, June rains like we normally do. About 7 inches, 7 to 8 inches. Now I know I'll working last year in June and July we started getting some of those rain showers coming through and they were streaky and it got to be about August and you could drive 10 miles and it looked different and the crops were better the grass was better I was up doing some grass uh, production in July on some grasslands and normally in July, it gets dry. Cool season grasses kind of go dormant. It was green as can be, which was kind of unusual. But I was in one of those bands that kind of kept getting some of those rains. So when you look at this, there, there will be probably areas that are better than that. They managed to get a few of those showers. Here again, April, May, June. We need to get it in that, that window. got started here I, this is kind of one of those lists I don't know how many tours I've been on and working on different operations and especially the tours and you know how it is when they when you put on a range tour the district or whoever you're usually putting them on or you're going someplace where <clears throat> geez they always got grass even when it's dry or they're inundated they're, they're doing something that you know that, that's a little bit different so you get all excited and jump on the bus and go out and uh, spend some time on the place. In the back of your mind, and I always do this, there's got to be a little hidden recipe there somewhere, um, you know, of the success of this. And I don't know if I've ever gotten that recipe figured out, but I've collected some ideas and tips related to management and, and those kinds of things that seem to be common with all of them. And I, you know, I'm, some of the tours up in the North Dakota, some of the innovative things going up there, some of the things in eastern Montana, that, that's, that's the kinds of things I'm talking about. Those operations that always seem to have grass, even when it's dry, there seems to be some commonalities to it. And, you know, and I look at this list, as long as it took me to collect it, it's pretty short. It's only eight things. <clears throat> you would think it would be pages and pages, but really it boils down to these. And yeah, I may have missed a few, but and some of them are kind of a, a collection of thoughts, but and some of them are very related. But <coughs> this is kind of it. And we'll, we'll go through some of them in a little more detail. Uh, some of them are pretty straightforward. Some of them you, you've heard about. That's kind of some of the stuff I want to share with you. Okay, this top one, animal forage balance, uh, proper stocking rate. Uh, everybody all understands that. Stocking rate is the acreage that you allocate to an animal uh, during a grazing season. And the acres that you allocate produce enough forage to support this animal for this long. That's a stocking rate. Everybody understands that. 
wherever you serve that. <clears throat> the little little tidbit on there is this changes as it gets drier or wetter. Yeah. Those operations seem to take advantage of that. They make adjustments for wet and dry periods every year. And it's very rare to have one class of animal. I, I can't remember a time being on some of those places where they just ran all breeding pairs or cow-calf pairs. They had some yearlings over here, you know, some heifers over here. And, and that's kind of how it gave them the opportunity to be flexible with some of their stocking rates. Those marketable animals, they were able to move in and out of the operation. Uh, but they were always taking advantage of that. Okay. Manage for rainfall and erosion. Uh, you do. You don't see bare ground out there. And I walk away from the bunch and stumble around and go over the hill, and you don't. You don't see it. They're very good at managing uh, residue on the ground surface, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Rest and recovery. They're always. If, uh, the ones that were grazing pastures more than once during the, the grazing season, uh, they always had rest built into those uh, systems. 30 to 60 days, some of them even more. Some of them even... Some of them even more. Year, two years, some of them. A lot of rest. Understood the value of that. Of course, it kind of depended on uh, grazing periods, and I'll get to that one, the shorter grazing periods. <clears throat> and I kind of went through and kind of, you know, writing down how the systems were all working. Typically less than 30 days in a pasture at any one time. Very rarely did you ever see them in their pasture longer than that. And if they did, Put a lot of that on, a lot of rest. Okay, this one has, they have a stock density high enough that it's hard to find patch grazing. And I'm gonna spend a little time talking about that. Stock density is different than stocking rate. Stock density is the number of animals you have at any point in time on the pasture. And lately, the new buzzword that you usually hear related to that or to define that is pounds of beef per acre. A lot of these guys do an ultra high stock densities. They're running 200,000 pounds of beef per acre. That's a stock density. <clears throat> a few years ago, it used to be head per acre. All the same thing. And we'll kind of get into that a little bit. Alternate the season of use, uh, spring, summer, fall. They're always changing that up. They're never grazing a pasture at the same time uh, every year. Uh, some of the innovative ones that uh, have opportunities for winter grazing, they're, they're pulling their, some of their winter grazing pastures. They rotate in and out of the summer grazing. Uh, that's pretty, every one of them is, is, is doing some form or fashion of that. And here again, the take half, leave half. Every one of them follows that wholeheartedly. Now there may be cases, depending on some objectives, they kind of dive in a little deeper than they want, probably some years, to focus on maybe at some management objective or something, but then they're putting lots of rest to it. So they're kind of using these tips and techniques interchangeably and, and, and behind each other. And then they always have a plan in place to implement action items when dry conditions happen. If production gets to this point, I do this. Everyone. Eight things that I came up with with all those hours of stomping around and going to workshops boil down to that. Okay. I'm going to get a little bit into the, the stocking rate and flex stocking rates. Um, I see people using this in South Dakota. Actually, the old drought handbook that South Dakota had with Nebraska, a 91 publication. Um, 
they all seen that, but it talks about flex stocking rates. So in the back there, uh, before I get too far into this, I actually put together a little example of this. We're going to go through this. Uh, this is the example that was in that handbook and how to do the calculations and grind the numbers. And it's pretty easy. I hate math, but it's easy. <clears throat> and then I kind of created a, uh, an example. I kind of went through it with these numbers. And then on the back page, I actually, there's a blank one there, so you can kind of mess around with it. Okay. Okay, this is how a lot of guys are adjusting their stocking rates every year. And here's a typical grazing unit that I probably commonly see up here. 1,000 acres, uh, average production is about 3,200 pounds per acre. They're running about 159 pairs. Uh, stocking rate of 1.05. Sounds about right, Neil, somewhere in there. <clears throat> Pretty common. Okay. This is how, they, how, how you could kind of project where you need to be at stocking rate for 2013. And I actually took data from Eureka. And some things you need to know is you need to know what the average precipitation is for your area. Most of you probably already know that. Most of you probably keep records, precip records, and have kept them long enough, you probably have your own averages. Use those. What it looks at is a forage year, and a forage year is different than a calendar year. It's real similar, well, it's actually what I talked about earlier with the, the slides of Leola and Roscoe. It looks at that October to September window, that precept that happened in that window. Okay, and we'll kind of go through this, it'll make sense. The precipitation in the year that just passed you multiply that by 75%, and this is kind of a weighted rainfall. And, and what that's suggesting is the rainfall we got last year is more, is, is, is more important. And then the rainfall that you received two years ago within that window, you uh, weight that at 25%. So for this unit at Eureka, in 2011, that October 10 to September window, they received 17.69 inches. That was two years ago, so I'm going to multiply that at 25%. 4.42. Last year, in that window, they received 11.75. Multiply that by 75%. Here's your total, 13.22. You divide that by your average rainfall, this is going to give you a stocking rate adjustment based on those rainfalls two years ago and last year this is uh, what it's going to generate for you and, and rainfall is related to production now you got to be real comfortable with these like these AUMs per acre or these numbers of animals when you're going to use this if you're slightly overstocked already <clears throat> this may not be enough. This has got to be kind of a sustainable situation. Hey, I'm comfortable with this. Every year when I graze, good or bad, unless it gets really bad, I'm good. I, I take half and leave half and I'm leaving residue. I'm comfortable with that. <clears throat> take the 71%, multiply that by the AUMs, the carrying on that that particular grazing unit, you end up with uh, uh, 746 AUMs. If you do the math, in 2013, you should be grazing 113 bears. But this is important. This is assuming that precipitation this spring is going to be near average, which in that area is about 7 inches. But you could have been doing these calculations last fall and, and had some idea of where things were going. Now, I use AUMs here because when we do feed and forage balances, we do all the conversions and use AUMs. I've seen where, if, they're, if you're comfortable with these numbers, I've seen where people that are using this, they just multiply this times that number of animals. It comes up to the same thing, 113. 
got to be comfortable with these numbers. It's sustainable. That's flexible stocking rates. They do that every fall. So they know what they're coming up against. And then they can make some decisions. This is using pairs, but if you had some of those yearlings out there that we talked about earlier, that's where you make those adjustments easier. Those marketable animals. And that's why I mentioned a lot of those operations, well, almost every one, they have multiple classes, kinds of animals on there, or classes of animals. did the calculations for what you should have done in 2011. You went through the calculations and pulled in the rainfall data. You should have been at 112% stocking rate adjustment. You could have been running 186 pairs that year based on the rainfall that we got two years ago and the year before. Probably could have. We had lots of grass. 2012 did the same thing. Come out to be about 99%, about right on. But put this big star down here. This is kind of where it come apart. We probably didn't get our average precept when we should have. And this was probably we should have done something. That's flex stocking rates. The other method that I've come across that some guys use, and that probably could be used, you know, you've done this and you're at 100%, but we get into those months where we need that moisture and it doesn't happen. It's been a few years now, but he told me what he does, and it worked for him. It was. He takes the, uh, okay, it comes to June 30th, July 1st, and we're at 60% normal preset. He added 10% and he destocked, he only, he destocked 30%. He, he, he adjusted his stocking rate 70%. He just added 10 on to the actual percent of average rainfall. And that worked for him. So as he was going through the graze, grazing season, he was monitoring that preset. Now that was focusing on current year's rainfall. He wasn't so much looking at those past years. That was one way that particular operation was managing stocking rates when it got dry and animal numbers. That's pretty simple to do. You know, and, you, and like I said, they do it in the fall because after uh, October, you can dig through your rainfall data and uh, grind the numbers. Question on this. Now, with those adjustments, are those calves kind of weighing the same weight in the fall? In this example, it's pairs. And usually when we set up stocking rates, we don't really account for the calves up until they're six months old. And a lot of times up here, the window between when they turn out and weaning falls pretty close to that. So we normally don't uh, make adjustments for the calves. Is that what you're asking? Well, I'm saying, okay, 2011, you had 112% stocking rate. Let's say the average weight of the calves when you pulled them off was 500 pounds. So in 2012, you reduce your stocking rate. Are those calves still 500 pounds? And then you know, going forward, you know, the outlook is you're going to have to reduce your stocking rate to 70%. Are those calves still going to weigh 500 pounds? Well, it depends on the quality of the grass and the lactation and all that. You know, that, that comes into play. How you supplement it. Um, I would say if you're destocking, you're in the dry conditions, the quality of the grass is probably down. You're probably not going to have the heavier calves that you're accustomed unless you're supplementing. OK. 
Okay, like I mentioned, there's an example of this for you to try. Uh, there was a lot of these uh, grassland conservation planners back there. They're basically a calendar. There's a lot of, uh, we've, we put in a lot of little reminders as you go for each month. Uh, write your rainfall on there. Or, there's a record of livestock grazing. You put a lot of information on there. When you're in pastures, the grass height, huh, precipitation. If you really, really want to, you know, adjust stocking rates, having your own rainfall data is, is great. Fine tunes it. And boy, like I mentioned last year with this streaky rains we got, yeah, if you had been going off Leola's weather station or somewhere where they didn't get it, you were making some probably decisions that weren't too accurate. Okay. And here's, uh, here's the example that's in this publication. <laughs> they actually used between 85 and 89, and I know there were some dry spells in that time frame, so this is kind of how they went through this on a um, operation and, and how they used the data, the predictions, and the rationale. And here's kind of something I put together, uh, just so you can kind of run through those numbers yourself. Okay, okay. stock density. Uh, like I mentioned, that's uh, is different than stocking rate. That's the number of animals you have at any given point in time. Uh, here's probably the three ways you commonly hear it uh, described. You know, eight, 810 pounds per acre. Here again, here's that pretty common grazing unit uh, that we see. 3,200 pounds running, in this case, only 135 pairs uh, is a stocking rate. <coughs> Here's what I mean by that, that patch grazing. And, and here's kind of how it all fits together. You have these pastures, roughly 200 acres in size. You, you turn them out there. Cattle are selective grazers if you, if you, if you let them. They'll, they'll go around, they'll, they'll hit certain spots. And, it, and it's what, what they're looking for, the most palatable grasses, uh, certain grasses at a certain time of the year, higher quality. The key on those. So over time, in some cases, here, here's looking from the road. Yeah, that don't look so bad. But then when you get out there, you see all these spots that are geez, pretty grazed off, and they have all this grass that I never used. That's what we're calling patch grazing. And, and, and you can you see that when you got a little bit of a problem with your stock density. So how do you solve that? Here's that same operation. Here's the numbers. Here's what a lot of those operations do. Uh, the red ones are temporary fences. They do a lot of temporary fencing. Um, trying something, testing something out before they start building permanent fence. And a lot of them don't like to build permanent, permanent fence. I'm, I'm kind of one of those too. Like, you can just kind of put in a fence, a temporary fence, and make it work. You know, it's a lot easier. But Here's what it gets you when you get away, when you get your stock density up, and you can kind of overcome some of that patch grazing, that inefficiency, uh, using more of the pasture of grasses. Because what happens is when you make them and put those cattle in a smaller area, they become less selective. They will hit more of that grass. <coughs> There's not too much space for them to kind of hit spots twice, three times when they're in there. The other thing that, that kind of comes into play is the length of time that they're in there. When they're in there, say, 30 days, they keep coming back to those spots. It greens up a little bit. And pretty soon, you change the composition of those spots to other shorter grasses and so forth. 
So by increasing the stock density, uh, we go from five pastures to nine pastures, they're about 111 acres in size, they were 200. Uh, our grazing days went from 33 to 19. The stock density went from 810 pounds per acre to 720 pounds, or 1720 pounds per acre. That's fine tuning that stock density, utilizing the grass more evenly, less waste. They, they all seem to kind of be in that realm of fine tuning that. Any questions on that? I've done some workshops and different things up here. I've talked about stock density before. You need to put some thought into it. Now, I can't believe you're going to let me move on. You didn't notice these numbers. Here we're running 135 pairs. And boom, now we're up to 159. Why is that? <coughs> Get that stock density up and, and see we're still producing 13 3,200 pounds same you're much more efficient at using the grass you have consequently you're, you can run some more animals stocking rate goes up <coughs> This is another thing I noticed on some of those operations that always seem to have, always have grass <clears throat> during those dry cycles. You actually see another interesting feature happen when you have wet cycles. Here's a photo, same, I'm standing roughly in the same spot. Here's the trees in the background. This was uh, 2008, kind of after the grazing season. 06 was pretty dry or a couple years in the recovery there. It looks pretty good shape. Pretty dominant with cool season grasses. Uh, pretty spot on. That was probably normal production. Here's that 2011. We got all that rain. 12 inches in 2011 in the spring. Went back out there and took these photos in September. Look at all these uh, warm season grasses that showed up. Well managed grasslands, when they do receive additional moisture, the species that are out there that do require that additional moisture, like big blue stem and cord grass, just boom, respond to that. They take advantage of those wet conditions and get after it. That's only a few years down the road there. Nobody planted that. They're there. When I see that, that's just that great indication of a well-managed, very diverse piece of grassland that is able to do these big shifts in species compositions when you get these dry and wet cycles. So are those species growing in there all the time and just having to express themselves and they don't get gray so hard then? Good management allows them to stay in good shape. If you went out there and really looked around, you would find some of them out there. There's, yep, they're out there. When they get that moisture, which they really need, they're more of a higher precept species. They take advantage of that. See that all the time. Normally you see big blue stem probably down through those overflow sites where there is additional more moisture. I took this photo last fall on a piece of grass <clears throat> and I get asked a lot, what is the minimum amount of 
cover or residue I should have on my grassland. And does it hurt me to graze my grasses dormant? Gets into November, why can't I just turn out there and start grazing again on, the, on those pastures? There's a lot of reasons why, and, and this by all means is nowhere close to what I would suggest to having enough cover. <laughs> it, uh, and actually looking down at the, the plants it, it themselves, you can see they're already starting a pedestal. Uh, <clears throat> a little background, we ran out of grass pretty early, uh, started doing some feeding out there on the pastures. And this is now what they have. The recovery now is going to be long after this trap gets passed. And it'll get passed. There's no doubt about that. So what is the minimum amount of cover I should have out there? There is actually a little magic number for that. And it hits a lot of very interesting points. Let's just say, and this is pretty true even for I think cover crops, Jason, Jason, one inch, uh, go out and measure a grass, one inch is about 200 pounds of air dry weight. Cover crops probably about the same, mm -hmm. 200, 250, somewhere in there. So you want to go out and measure the grass, grab the leaves because that's what you want to measure, not the top of the seed head. Grab the leaves and pull it up and measure it. That's the conversion you can do to see how much grass you have. Pretty quick. Animal performance. Hey, we're back to our 1,200 pound cows. And let's just say uh, they need daily 3% of their body weight daily intake. So that's 36. They need 36 pounds a day to maintain. Produce milk, produce beef, whatever. Here's what grass height does to you. Here's our 3,200 pounds. Turn them out there. They're pounds of daily intake, 36 pounds. But you notice as the grass becomes less, shorter, this intake starts to fall off. When you get down here to 400 pounds, which is 200, two inches tall, your uh, pounds of daily intake is down to 21.6. Now, there's a reason for that, and this is probably a fancy way of saying you're starving your cows, but because <laughs> <laughs> as the grass gets shorter, cattle gr usually graze six to eight hours a day, so there's so many bites in that period, and as the grass gets shorter, they have to work harder, they, they prefer to use their tongues. They will use their teeth if it gets shorter. But if they have to work harder in that time frame, that's less time actually intaking. So the intake goes down. There's just not enough grass. So if you kind of look at that, there seems to be kind of a nice little, hey, if it's a thousand pounds, I still can maintain my pounds daily intake that I need. Okay. Get down here to soil health, control erosion, conserve water. There's all kinds of data, research from here to Texas. How much residue you should have on your soil surface on grasslands. To add organic matter, soil structure, hold water so that it can infiltrate, reduce evaporation, got cover on the ground, keep the soil cool, reduce erosion. About that thousand pounds. And that kind of changes as you go from the short grass to mid grass to tall grass. There's a little bit of a little different number that they kind of use, but for us it's about that thousand pounds. Now, Jeff talked about this infiltration. When you got cover out there, you got cover out there, you're getting that rain coming. It's hitting leaf material, it's it's hitting what's left out there, it's slowing it down so that it hits the ground and it has time to run in. Now if you have bare ground out there, 
the rain hits that bare ground and seals it off. And when it seals it off, it likes to go this way, run across the ground. But if you got residue out there and slow that rain down, and then if it does rain hard enough and decide to move this way, it's running into that debris and litter and it's slowing it down and it's giving it some time. And plus you haven't sealed it off when that hard rain's hitting it. So you need the water to go down, not across, during the growing season. And that's what that'll do for you. Okay, the old take half leave half. We've talked about that. It's common knowledge that grass produces twice as, twice as much amount of leaves that it really needs. So that's why we can remove half of it. When you do, when you, and this by weight, but as you remove more, get past that 50% by weight, you start to have some really devastating effects to the root system. At 60%, the root, root growth kind of decreases in half. You start getting into that 80% and then um, you get, get complete die-off. So if you're going through a dry cycle, which plant do you want out there? I'll be the one that's got this nice deep root system. And in this neck of the woods, I've done enough um, utilization, uh, proper grazing use in the fall, measuring grass, you know, where's that take half, leave half for a lot of the grasses that we have here. And it's about, at that 1,000 pounds, or five inches. You look at all these things that that five inches does for you. Helps you out with that animal performance. Soil health, control erosion, conserve water, plant health and vigor. That's big. You really went the other way here. Now we're going to have some infiltration problems. We actually probably have some damage to the grass. There's a lot of those parameters, and the big one for you is the animal performance. It's going to take a big hit. That weeds, too. Absolutely. That's Mother Nature trying to get her own cover on there. Because we all hate weeds, and now we're you know, going down that path. Okay, Jeff showed some of this, and this kind of ties in real nice. This is something real similar. If you really think about it, okay, if it's grass, it's grass. Does it make much difference? Well, some of those things I talked about. You're over here on this, on this side. We're probably invasive species now, shorter growing, continuous graze, which means the cattle are probably in that pasture longer than 30 days a lot of times. So there's a lot of hoof action. So there could be some compaction issues that's affecting infiltration. There could be some more, there's bare ground because we're getting below that five inches. When it does rain, we get those intense rains in the summer, which we usually do get. Uh, they seal off. Now we got water running the wrong way. Here they actually, similar to what Jeff was talking about, they actually, here's the infiltration rate under the rotation graze versus the continuous. At five inches per hour under the rotation of graze, and just a smidge over a half an inch on the continuous graze. For all those reasons. Look at the different in tilt, the depth of the organic matter, the black. Grazing management. Saving that water, it's huge. Okay, drop contingency plans. All those operations have some kind of plan in place where when conditions get to this point, I am going to make some adjustments. And so they have some kind of a trigger, which means how bad does it have to get when I'm gonna do this? How bad does it have to get when I'm gonna do this? <clears throat> Some of them write it down, some of them just know what they, you know, that's what they're going to do. Um, we actually, our drought tool is, and we're going to get into that, kind of talks about, and it's designed for you to kind of document what you're going to do. Okay, 
establishing triggers. Yeah, it wasn't too long ago, that's what it looked like. And someday, hopefully soon, we'll be back to that. Here's kind of one of the triggers that I commonly see, and, and honestly, if you're doing a probably good job of grazing management, this condition where the plants are starting to show moisture stress, we're starting to get that yellow. I took all these photos in July. The grass is starting to get that little bit of yellow tinge. A lot of times that's kind of normal in a lot of years. It starts to get hot and dry. But that's kind of that normal phase. And this usually ties into about 75% of normal production. And like I said, a lot of times if you're doing good grazing manual, you probably don't even notice these. You may have some issues with water later in the year because it did dry down a little bit, the quality of water. But for the most part, this, this indicator of status, um, if you're doing good grazing management, you probably don't notice it. Okay, at risk. Here's where you're probably at. We're, well, we probably were at it last year. Probably that in between 85 and 90 percent of normal production. The plants are showing signs of moisture stress. See how brown it's starting to get? Uh, that's probably where you're at. And we've probably got a lot of places in the state that are probably going to be at least in this one, and maybe the next one. Here's some of the action items that I kind of collected through the course of time on some of these operations. And a lot of these, I'm sure, you've all heard of before. these back there. This is something we just put together. It's common grazing uh, management in South Dakota. This is kind of the grazing systems we commonly see. Uh, it goes from continuous grazing to rotational grazing to uh, short duration, twice through. Kind of gives a little pros and cons of each. And then on the back page it talks about the drought contingency plan, uh, what phases there are, this normal risk and drought that we're talking about. And then on the back the page, there's all these action items that we've collected uh, over the years that we commonly see people use. This one here, the top one, I'm going to talk about a few of these. Uh, combining herds and allocating all remaining forages in each pasture to one herd. Grazing periods will be shortened. Maintain cover on the soil. Well, that sounds uh, real similar to dealing with it with some stock density. You all have those pastures out there where you go out there and there's a lot of grass that maybe they haven't touched. This is how they're kind of dealing with that. Some of them kind of initiate some of that when it gets drier. They, they get more animals, get that stock density up use those pastures. All the animals are together, it's kind of easier to watch things and you just kind of keep moving them. Weaning calves early, that, I run into that all the time. In fact, I got an example that I got a, uh, a, a series of photos of uh, these risks or these conditions and kind of what that landowner did when those conditions hit. Uh, this is commonly used, wean early. That makes a big difference. You switch to those cows, uh, get the calf off, they don't have to produce that milk, their intake isn't as high, it makes a big difference. Uh, culling early, removing 10 to 20 percent, you know, when you're getting into these conditions. Hey, if you're flex stocking rate, you know, you, you probably already dealt with that problem. Uh, reduce the number of replacement heifers. Plant and graze cover crops. Jason, the plug in for you there. <laughs> Here, use range management techni techniques to distribute livestock more uniformly. Uh, this is doing that, but using herding, placing salt in the right places, pulling them in the areas that they normally don't graze. If you're trying to use all that forage that you have up there, there's probably a lot of forage that doesn't get used. Um, you're just trying to target some of that. Get better distribution. Temporary fences to do that. Okay, this is the, kind of the, the bottom end. We're, we're starting to get pretty dry. We're less than 85% of normal production. 
plants are looking stressed. We had a lot of that here come fall. Uh, a lot of the operations, when it gets to these conditions, if you look at a lot of these, they're, they're talking about removing animals. A big percent, 20 to 50 percent. Uh, they move the cattle off the pastures and start feeding. Don't try to feed through a drought. That's just bad, bad news. You know, unless you got a lot of hay, and maybe you know if you can stretch it out. But don't try to do that. And don't feed on your pastures. That's that, that, that's not good either. We can talk about that residue. And then market you know, class of stocks such as yearlings. And, you know that's why those operations run different classes of animals because they have that option. They can quickly get rid of some animals. Market. Here's an operation in Hughes County. Uh, I went out and took photos. Yeah, you're done, but whatever. You're <laughs> 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 in Jason's time. Take it up with him. <laughs> Just quick, and, and I'm not going to get to the drop tool, but here. <laughs> There's this back here. It's a user guide for that. It's got the link. It's on our website. It's easy to navigate to. And it's a step-by-step -step guide of opening it up and point and click kind of a thing. Okay? Pretty easy. If you have any questions, you just call your field office and they'll, they'll help you get through that. Okay? You probably wanted to call Holly. Sure. Since she's making it quit. Sure. <laughs> Everybody at Call Hall. <laughs> I apologize for that. I kind of wrap up. I really want to talk about this. Though. Here's a photo that I went out and took. I took these photos right after they got out of those, this pasture. So this was uh, the end of July. It was in 2009. We're about 85% of normal preset. He weaned early that year. And he normally grazed till October, end of October. He, kind of, he ended grazing the first part of October. And that's what it looked like. Five inches there, easily. Here's in 2011, above average. Look at all that. That's when this thing started to turn, though, in the fall of 2011. Look how dry it got. He happened, in, and he's moving the, the time of the year around on these pastures. This was the end of September when he got done here. But look at all that grass. The rains came in that nice window, April, May, June. Then it got hot and dry, dried it out, but it still grew grass. It came at the right time. Didn't do anything here. Here was last year, 55% of normal. He reduced his herd by... 30% and he only grazed till mid-August. He shortened his grazing season. And that's the, uh, when I went out there shortly after. The point is, still no bare, down, bare ground. He got off there, cut the losses, fight another day, leave it in good shape. Made those adjustments. That's Hughes County, by the way. An example of an ongoing plan with action items and when they kick in. Okay, round and round we go. This is kind of where we live. It'd be nice to be here. We were here not too long ago, but prepare for it. I know you all do have plans. <coughs> I've been on a lot of your places, and I know you do. We're, we're coming into one of those dry ones. Cross our fingers. If we can get some precept, we can we can get some production, you know, 70%. Better for some others. All right. I have went over. Do you want to go ahead and address Chuck's question for order on the fertilizer? Fertilizer. Last year when it, we got that hot March... I knew some guys that went out and put fertilizer down. It didn't help when it got dry. Plants 
shut down, they didn't take it up. Now whether there'll be some residual of it, but I'm guessing they will some. I don't suggest fertilizing to, to bring a pasture out of a dry cycle. Plants aren't active to keep it going and you can use it. It's a function of precept. If it doesn't get rain, it's not going to produce up to its potential. So. But when it's normal precept, there's some justifying use of fertilizing. Pasture, so not so much on native grass. I fertilize that. Usually, you create opportunities for it. the invasive species really like the nitrogen, so they get real healthy and vigorous, and then put more competition on the game. You a proponent of ultra high density pathway? For a treatment to maybe deal with an older burden of, say, uh, bluegrass, uh, put a lot of numbers on there, knock all that perch residue down, get it cycling, and then go back to something else at this point. Can you repeat that question? Uh, the question was is uh, if I'm a proponent of ultra high stock band speeds. There's, there's time and place for it. You can do some really neat things with a high number of cattle in a small area. It'll shock you. The response you The last thing I've got this time. They're doing some work with it. South Dakota State's working with some operators on ultra high stock density. The question is of the sustainability of it. Can you long term do that and still be viable, uh, produce those? Pretty staggering pounds of beef per acre. How does the grass respond to that? Those kinds of things. They're working on it. Right now, we're kind of using it as a treatment. 